Hello. Oh, okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Redke. I'm the president of POSWAY. POSWAY stands for the, Pre uh, the Pennsylvania Association of State School uh, Social Work Education. Excuse me. I'm mixing Poshi with POSWAY the Pennsylvania Association of Social Work Education. So we are focused on social work education for Pennsylvania. Um, we're happy to go beyond Pennsylvania or invite people beyond Pennsylvania to participate in these workshops. But we try to do work workshops um, maybe every other month, something like that. We've, we've had quite a, a boom of workshops in the spring and they've all been very, very successful. And um, the ideas are related to anything um, around social work. It could be specifically related to education or social work, the field. We have a couple workshops coming up uh, next week, actually, same time, same place. Um, the Zoom link is always the same. The password's always the same, Pauseway. Um, and it's regarding the BSW licensure. As you know, uh, Pennsylvania has passed uh, the law that um, undergraduate students need to get a licensure, a BSW license. And so we have sort of a one hour teaser um, for students and even faculty who want more information about what we're doing about how to get that to study for the licensure. And then in June, we have an all day study workshop. It's really geared towards either professionals who need to get the license or students. So that's a great workshop. Um, if you're not on the mailing list and wanna get on the mailing list, just send Pauseway an email. I'll put in the Pauseway email in the chat in a minute. Um, and then you can get on and hear more about the workshops. I uh, can't stand email, so I promise not to email you the, to death. I try to send out no more than one email a month. Um, and I try to announce all the future upcoming workshops. Um, so we have a number of Pauseway representatives here and I'm gonna let you just say hi. I'm gonna give it to Wade next. He's the vice president of Pauseway. Pa Wade, do you wanna say hi? Sure. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here with everyone today and a really great topic. Uh, one little correction on you, Alex. Next week starts at 2.30. Oh, 2.30. Thank you for that. Yes, 2.30. Most of our workshops start at 1, but yeah, this one was a little different. Okay, any other Pauseway, um, Pauseway people you want to raise your hand and say hi to the room? Or are we going to be shy? Okay, there you go. They're, saying, they're all, they're waving. So um, all social work faculty are welcome to be uh, a part of the Pauseway leadership. If you have a great idea to run a workshop like this, uh, you know, let us know. We'll, we'll help you sort of organize and coordinate that. Um, yeah, that's it. That's my speech about Pauseway. So what I want to do is I want to introduce the speakers to you. Uh, the other thing, too, is you may know how to adjust your view, but you could adjust it so you could see everybody on the board or you could adjust it just to see the speaker, like whoever is speaking at the time. The other thing too is Zoom has recently changed it that you can move the little squares. So if you move all the speakers to the top of your screen, then you can see all the speakers you know, at the top, but you can still see everyone. Well, anyways, all right. So I'm gonna start with Omar Martinez, Dr. Martinez. He's an associate professor at Temple University. Um, in, in the School of Social Work. And then um, Omar, would you wave again, just so everyone can see you, there you go. And then Andy Dunlap, Dr. Dunlap is an, associ is an associate professor um, and the program director at Bloomsburg University. Um, do you wanna wave? There you go, Dr. Dunlap. And then we have Dr. Akbar. She is also an associate professor and the program director of the MSW program at Westchester University. Dr. Akbar, there you go. And then Dr. Merrick, Matthew Merrick, he's a clinical assistant professor for the Center for Social Work Education at Widener University. There you go. And then Annette Day, if I'm saying your, right, your name right, um, she is at Boundary Span, uh, which is an LLC. So fantastic. We're so excited to have you all here um, for today's uh, workshop regarding how can we transform our education um, to try to make it better in these very specific ways. So I'm going to hand it over to um, Dr. Martinez. Excellent. Thank you for having me here. And a big shout out to the co-speakers as well for their commitment um, to this important line of work. Um, I'm gonna be sharing some slides here. Um, 
Excellent. Here's the agenda that I have for today. I promise that I'm going to get it in 10 minutes. Each of us have 10 minutes to present. My own teaching philosophy, I'm going to walk you through, through that. Then I'm going to go ahead and, and, and provide an overview of how we transform the social policy courses um, at Temple University, along with um, Dr. Friedman. And then I'm going to wrap up with um, a few discussion points, but most of the book today is going to be about the processes um, that, that we follow to transform these two MSW policy courses at Temple University. My own teaching philosophy I, I, is really guided by intersectionality, and intersectionality examines the juncture of multiple stigmatized identities and overlap of institutional power structures that fall within or across several categories. One or more coexisting health conditions, such as HIV, mental illness, childhood sexual abuse, or substance use, experiences such as incarceration and the pre and post migration experience, as well as social forces and structures, including discrimination, institutional racism, stigma, anti-immigration rhetoric, structural racism, violence, and cultural imperialism. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer in Socratic method. Um, I, I use it in all of my courses. Uh, this method, this mode of teaching implies that questioning is important to excellence of thought. Critical thinking provides the conceptual tools for understanding how the mind function in its pursuits of meaning and truth. And Socratic questions employs those tools in framing questions essential to that pursuit. The processes of how we transform these two policy courses, and here are the steps, right, um, that we follow. First, um, Laurie and I met to discuss the need for curriculum transformation in the MSW courses at Temple University. We also met with Bernie Newman, director of that curriculum committee. We then developed um, a survey and comprehensive focus group guide um, uh, that could guide this focus group discussion. Some of the samples questions include, what led you to respond to this email invitation? What thoughts do you have? What skills, competence, knowledge that you gain from these previous courses? And what comes to mind when you think about reimagining re the curriculum transformation through anti-oppressive and anti-racism lens, right? The focus group questions intended to assess the impact of racism and white supremacy among the students, evaluate and assess the skills, competencies, and knowledge gained from these previous two courses, and transform existing policy courses. We conducted a focus group using the nominal group technique with 10 MSW students. And, and, and just a side note, they were paid paid um, um, to be part of these focus groups because one of the core things, you know, like we get students involved and um, they have bills to pay, right? They're, they're committed to this work and, and that's important, right? Um, pay these students because their voice matters, right? And, and they're contributing um, to the science process. And then we analyze uh, data using um, framework uh, analysis methods. Four common themes emerge from these focus groups, right? The pervasive impact of racism and white supremacy on a student's well-being. It impacts our students. The importance of including skills to dismantle racism within organizations and systems and clinical practice competence to address ethno-racial trauma among clients. The need for restructuring competencies that encompass um, topics related to environmental racism and macro social work practice and increase knowledge on methods and theories for analysis, development and restructure of existing policies, including intersectionality and critical race theory. What are the voices from these students, right? On content, and, and, and this is really uh, their voices, right? Even the social work, the social justice course, we did not cover the intersections of identity very thoroughly. Very little discussion of transgender issues, intersex issues, sex workers issues, or LGBT issues. It was very starkly situated in a second wave of feminism. And this is really, really um, positive construct constructive criticism. On the historical context and systems, I think discussing the system that social workers work 
in that have racist history, DHS, child protective services, the criminal justice systems, right? And more having difficulties about conversation about these issues, right? Uh, the students wanted to see, the students are gonna be part of these systems and they wanted to learn how to dismantle these systems, right? Uh, so, so, so it's not only exposing them to the system, but it's also giving them the tools to question and challenge the systems that are gonna, they're gonna be part of, right? Um, so they wanted to see more in that context as well. On social work practice, right? How to get an article published, right? Students are looking for that practical component. How to write a testimony, right? Uh, I learned a lot, a lot in um, about the local government, the public hearing assignment. So we have now a public hearing assignment. I like that Omar adjusted assignments to fit current events, the task force on COVID-19. I also felt that I was pushed to speak in public, the Socratic method and think critically. Um, one of the core pieces is now that we're pushing students to publish right, to, to, to get these papers and get it published somewhere. And um, a big shout out to Kay Kelly, Nai Soto, Nadi, and Chaina. They published a paper last year from my course. They build this assignment and they publish it as a commentary. So let's be thinking about that. How can we get our students to publish on these important topics, right? Not just writing a paper and then sitting in your computer um, um, there. What have we started to think, right, and, and, and to start to do with these policy courses? Embed immigration topics in our courses, right? And, and immigration should be considered as a determinant of health. When drastic immigration policies, we should consider the potential long-term impact of these policies on immigrants, right? Research, including our team's work, has documented the detrimental impact of the inter intertwined process of immigration on health and wellness. For immigrants, anti-immigration rhetoric is often linked to HIV acquisition and transmission, delays in HIV prevention and care, substance use, negative mental health outcomes, and isolation. So let's start thinking critically and, 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 and embedding this literature uh, on immigration as a structural and social determinant of health for some folks. Um, we have also started to embed this um, healing ethno-racial trauma, so models of care as part of our curriculum. Um, um, Chavez Duenas um, is one of my favorites. Um, she developed this model of care. So now in our courses, we introduce our student um, about this framework, healing ethno-racial trauma that takes into the relation community, individual, and family structures um, as part of the course. Dr. DeGroy's work on post-traumatic enslaved syndrome, right? Uh, before um, I started to introduce this topic in the classroom, none of my clinical students knew about post-traumatic enslaved syndromes. So now as part of the policy courses, uh, I include Dr. DeGroy's writing about this post-traumatic enslaved syndromes. Also thinking outside the books, right? And, and let's make sure that where students are in, um, uh, exposed to implementation science. And implementation science is an integrated concept that link research and practice to accelerate the development and delivery of public health approaches, right? Um, there are four categories and objective of implementation science, informing policy design, improving people health, strengthening healthcare delivery system, empowering communities and beneficiaries. I, I just wanted to give a big shout out um, uh, to Dr. Cavaza and Baubon. They have started to move this line of work and how can we use implementation science to address inequities in healthcare. So let's also expose our students on how these frameworks and models can address inequities in healthcare. Um, this paper, um, it's one of my favorite, it was published last year and I'm gonna be sharing these PowerPoint presentations with all of you. Also expose our students to policy, right? And, and I have seen a big shift at NIH over the past two years to fund research that could address the social and structural determinants of health, in particular structural racism and discrimination. So as part of these courses, I also expose the students to the latest science, right? To the latest shift at NIH on, on how to address um, structural racism and discrimination. Uh, last, I just wanted to give a big shout out to all the students out there. There's a lot of training opportunities. The HIV Center at Columbia University have a T32 program, a postdoc on HIV prevention and research. UCSF um, Visiting Professors Program is another great program. They give you $20,000 um, to, do, to do research and, and, and including uh, issues of racism and inequities. Um, Dr. Cavazas T32 program. Uh, and so forth. So I'm going to be sharing um, that with you. And, and with that, um, I think I did it in 10 minutes. 
Um, and then um, thank you for your time and look forward to the discussion. All right, and I think, are we going in the order on the flyer? Yeah. Okay, so that means I'm up next. Hi, everybody. Let me share my screen here, one second. Uh, sorry. Okay, so um, as Alex said, I am, um, I'm Andy Dunlap, I'm at Bloomsburg University. I'm actually the outgoing program director of the BSW program and the incoming uh, program director of the MSW program, which we're starting in the fall. So we're wearing lots of hats and we're um, kind of kind of crazy right now. Um, uh, just to say that um, in terms of my thinking about anti-oppressive and anti-racist pedagogy, sort of um, talking about my positionality, um, I, um, I uh, of course, think a lot about inter intersectionality and um, various, I don't know, critical theories, if you will, but queer theory is really the frame that I bring to this, uh, to this discussion. And in that sense, I mean, um, stepping outside of what are the expected, uh, what's the expected system and stepping outside of that system and looking back at it into that other space, looking back at it and uh, thinking about how do we dismantle, how do we change, how do we help people survive? In whatever system it is, system of oppression that we're talking about um, about here, um, and um, and as I tell my students, um, systems of oppression, of course, um, are not going to be dismantled or changed unless the people who are benefiting from them are participating in the dismantling of them. So I also, in terms of taking an anti-racism stance as a white person, I think that's really important um, for all of us to um, be cognizant of that, but also to be talking about. Um, all right, so I have a fairly narrow focus here today, but I look forward to the discussion where we can talk more broadly about these concepts. Um, I'm going to be presenting an example of infusing um, anti-oppressive and anti-racism um, lesson, if you will, into foundational um, social work, um, uh, well, a class, actually. And so by foundational here, I'm talking about an introductory class in a BSW program. However, as we all know, the BSW curriculum is, is meant to be the equivalent of the first year of the MSW, the foundational year. So this, uh, this um, example, I think, could also apply to um, first year master's students. So the problem that I'm trying to address here um, while teaching important content is that often majority students, um, students who, white students, students who benefit from systems of oppression are, are woefully unprepared to, to wrestle with these concepts and actually are quite defensive. Um, when, when confronted with them. So, so that's one, one part of the equation. Another part of the equation is lots of our students are experts on systems of oppression because they experience them on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do you make basic lessons that are relevant to both of those populations and everybody kind of in between um, is, is part of what I'm trying to get at um, with this example. So uh, for our purposes here today, I'm gonna focus more on the process of how I do that and how I think about it and the theory that goes into how I do it and less on the actual content of what the lesson is that, I'm, that I've been teaching students. Um, and this example actually does come from um, a class I'm currently teaching and um, just over the last couple of weeks. Um, so the main um, piece of theory that I use to help structure what I'm doing with students is the intercultural development model which you may be familiar with, um, it actually comes out of, um, or many of us are familiar with, it actually comes out of study abroad research and sort of thinking about how do we help students who have a cross-cultural experience writ large, like a study abroad experience, how do we help them uh, develop a more global mindset, if you will. This model is also very useful for helping people to learn how to um, uh, help people who come from different backgrounds than they do, or to empathize across difference. So, so my research focuses on a couple different things, but, but one area is on um, helping study abroad students maximize how they can get the most out of their experience. But another part of my teaching is how can you help social work students empathize across difference? And I use this same model, and I'll show you what I mean by that uh, to do so. So, and again, so I don't feel like my goal is to teach this model, but let me just tell you a little bit about it today so you'll know, uh, so you'll have a better understanding of the example. So in this model, we have five different stages um, that, uh, that describe movement from a monocultural mindset to a multicultural mindset. And some of the labels I think are unfortunate, but they've been around for a while, so they're, they're what's stuck. Um, and briefly, very briefly, 
Denial is just un uh, uh, with no awareness of other cultures that are out there. Polarization would be highly valuing one culture and highly devaluing another culture. So someone who takes a racist stance would be in a polarization uh, place, if you will, highly valuing maybe their own white culture and devaluing other cultures. Minimization would be sort of the, the, the vibe of everybody's the same. Why do we have to focus on any differences? So it's better than polarization, but it's maybe not where we want our students to be, our, our, our social work practitioners to be, right? Here is where people will say things like, I don't see color. You know, why do we need to talk about race? Are we in a post-racial society, if you will? And then acceptance, again, kind of another unfortunate, um, I think, uh, label that's, that we're kind of stuck with. But acceptance really gets at the idea of um, seeing beyond um, like cultural stereotypes and seeing into the depth of cultural groups and understanding the different um, diversities within um, uh, different groups. Uh, so, um, so for instance, um, the one example of acceptance is what uh, is uh, you know if you can tell if someone's being a jerk in their own cultural context, you're probably in acceptance. You can kind of understand them you know within their own cultural context. Um, acceptance is also the place where we recognize that we have our own cultural background and that it's valid and important, but it is no more important than anybody else's um, cultural background. And then adaptation is moving into a place where you can hang on to your own cultural identity and move within other cultural identities with some facility. Uh, so, so if you can tell a joke that's funny in another cultural context, you're perhaps functioning in an adaptation sort of a place. Um, and um, and one, one really uh, useful thing about the intercultural development model is um, it's been developed over time. Uh, Mitch Hammer and his group have uh, created the Intercultural uh, Development Inventory, the IDI, which you can take and it will place you on this scale. And it places you in two different ways. It gives you a score, basically. But then it also gives you a score that relates to how you think you rate on this scale. And of course, human beings being human beings, we all almost almost everybody overrates their intercultural competence. So that's useful because um, when you're um, when you're receiving your results, and it's always through a sort of a counseling sort of context, if you're getting your results. Um, and I like to say I'm working with someone who I've just given the IDI to. I can say to them, well, here's where you see yourself. Here's how you see yourself, and then here's where you really are. So let's see if we can close that gap. So it's actually really useful if we if we back up for a second and think, you know, uh, if we say to students, racism bad, stop that. Many of them are just going to shut down. But if we say to them, hey, here's where you are, here's where you want to be. Let's see how we can close that gap. And very importantly, this model provides some specific suggestions and actually even assignments about how you can move from one stage to the next stage. And recognizes that if you're in the polarization stage, forget about acceptance for now you need to focus on getting to minimization. And then once you're in minimization, then you can move on to the next stage. So this model really helps with this, um, this question of like, you have students at all of these different places and understanding and, and uh, intercultural ability. How do, you, how do you do something relevant to all of them? These other theorems, and, and so I'll, come, I'll circle back around to this main, this main piece, the intercultural development model. These other theories are important to what I'm doing, but less central. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to Janet Finn and her just practice model. She gives a great framework uh, for helping students to be critically reflective uh, by thinking about meaning, context, power, history, and possibility. And I've got sources at the end of this if you want to track down her, her writing. And then the last one I use here is HTBF theory, um, which you may have heard of. It's um, how to boil a frog theory. Um, it's unknown, possibly made up. The idea is that if you drop a frog into boiling water, it'll jump right out. But if you have a frog sitting in a pot of water and you slowly bring the heat up, the frog will stay in. The, the way I use this theory is I slowly begin to introduce the concepts until we get to a point where students are articulating to me how they can unravel racism without me ever having said to them, racism bad, stop. Um, so it's very, it can be very, uh, very useful and accessible um, uh, strategy for them. Um, all right. Let's move on to just the example. Um, I will uh, share with you some context about the class I'm teaching. It's an intro to social, wealth, uh, social work and social welfare class. Uh, it's a Zoom class with 105 students. By the way, I hate it. It's a terrible format to teach anything in, but whatever, it's where we are. Um, you can see that most of the students are first, first year sophomore students. Some of them are actually high school students, um, traditional age students, undergraduates. 
Um, um, many of them are interested in social justice issues or are a, social, a pre social work major. And um, about half of them describe themselves as middle of the road, and about oh, maybe 40% of them describe themselves as liberal or um, very liberal. So, just a snapshot of, of who's, uh, who's in the class. This is the content, and I said, as I said, I'm not going to focus too much on this, but this is the content of the lesson. And uh, you can see it's about um, defining and describing structures of oppression all the way down to what are next possible steps that you could involve yourself in, in terms of uh, is working to dismantle a system of oppression. Obviously, it's not enough for us just to teach these concepts to the students or to have them be able to recognize or categorize. We want them to be able to actualize and engage in practice, right? That's the social work, that's, that's, our, that's, our, that's where the money is for social work, right? Um, so that is the content. The way that I've structured it, fairly traditional um, in this format, it's a bizarre Zoom lecture or whatever, little, little boxes. Um, but uh, the ideas around social justice, anti-racism are embedded in the larger narrative of the class from the beginning. So how to boil a frog, right? So we're doing a large survey of different social problems, um, talking about poverty, talking about healthcare system, talking about the prison system, talking about, I don't know, everything, right? And all along I'm saying, yeah, and let's notice that brown and black people are overly represented in the number of households living below the poverty line or in this or in that or in this. So by the time we get to actually talking about anti-racism, they're already loaded up with a whole bunch of just symptoms of the, of the problem. Um, and then a couple of assessment pieces, which I won't go into here, but we can come back to um, uh, when we get to the discussion uh, piece later. And then here's the last bit, that the important part that I really wanted to share with you, which is at the end of this kind of unit, at the end of this lecture, I, I posed this question, for, this question to them, uh, what to do about systems of oppression. And I say to them, I present this list on the left-hand side to them. I don't present the model. I never mention the model to them at all in the class ever. But I present this list on the left-hand side and I say to them, hey, here's a list of things you could consider doing next. And what I want you to do, th these are, and these are arranged in order of increasing difficulty from top to bottom. And what I want you to do is pick one, pick the level that you think is gonna be a challenge for you, but isn't gonna be so overwhelming that you won't be able to complete it. And, uh, and, and, and you pick it and then you, know, you decide, you get to decide, now that you have all this knowledge, you get to decide where to go. And so, um, so in a way, what happens is students arrange themselves or calibrate themselves based on where they are in this model without ever even knowing that the model is there in the background. But it allows, but it allows me to target students all up and down the spectrum and, uh, and engage in meaningful learning um, around what do you do next. Really quickly, here's some data that I collected for them immediately after that. Um, after today's lecture, many of them had a, a much better understanding of basic concepts about oppression and also about what to do next. So at least in terms of their immediate response to the lesson, um, I feel like it's very effective. Here are the references that I talked about. You guys will have access to these slides um, at some point, somehow, I'm sure. Alex will help us facilitate that. Um, and with that, I will uh, cede the floor to, I am not sure who's next, actually. Thank you. I think Dr. Akbar, do you want to go next? Sure, I will go next. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I just... I was going to talk a little bit about, I don't have a fancy PowerPoint, but I was going to talk a little bit about how we've sort of addressed this um, in my department um, or some things that we started to think about. Um, I just became department chair in May, so I'm going on a year now, and um, it's not something that I ever thought I would end up doing. I didn't really have ambitions to be in an administrative position. I really love working with students and teaching, and so that really was my focus, what I sort of got the word that comes to mind is railroaded, but I don't think that's the best term, <laughs> but somehow I ended up here, right? And so, you know, I'm in, in this position in a really sort of unique time and space, right? And have a, I think a unique opportunity to, as a black woman, and there are not a lot of black women professors in our department to sort of um, look at our curriculum and look at our program and see what I can do to, um, 
to support some of the changes that we've been talking about for many years since I've been at Westchester, right? So uh, there's been a couple of sort of different approaches that I've taken and that I've talked to you know, our, our department, our faculty and our staff about. One thing um, that I've been really passionate about is uh, this idea of reckoning with social works, roots of white supremacy and paternalism. Um, and I don't think this is something that we see discussed very often, or at least not throughout my career, my education. Um, so we've started to talk about this in our department and in our courses and really looking at what are the ways that social workers contribute to oppressive systems. And spoiler alert, there are a lot of them, unfortunately, right? And so we've started to have these conversations not only with our with our you know, staff and faculty, but obviously with our students as well. And getting students to see and understand the ways that they sort of help perpetuate oppression. Um, and I think that's been a really rich conversation, a difficult conversation to have, to start to have, but also a very important one to have. Um, I think the other, another thing that I think about is this, you know, social workers I think have known this word anti-racism for a while, but now it's everywhere. Now it's a buzzword, right? And so attention to, starting to pay attention to what does this really mean and what is our commitment to it? Is it just for this season where it's popular, where we, we're talking about it, but how can we make changes in our department that are sustainable, that last beyond when the next big thing comes up, right? And so really reevaluating and looking to looking at our commitment to anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice. And so what that's meant for me and for our department, I think is it addressing it in many of the different aspects of our program. Um, one of the ones is admissions, right? Um, looking at our admissions process, looking at the data for who is admitted and who is denied admission to, um, looking at what are our questions, what are our prompts for um, writing, I mean, what are our prompts for, um, for our uh, you know, admissions questions. One of the things that we've tried to do is start to interview, for a few years now, we've tried to interview every student that applies to our program as a way to sort of capture some of the strengths that folks have that are not captured on paper, which we think has been really important. Um, and then also to talk to students in the interviews about what their understanding of anti-racism and anti-oppressive practice was. Another thing we've had lots of discussions in our department about um, is uh, like our assessment process. Lots of discussions about writing. You know, what does it mean? Does it mean just because you do perfect APA and have per perfectly formed paragraphs, does that mean you're gonna be a good social worker? No, it doesn't, right? So how can our assessment practices reflect good practice and commitment to the field. And I think this is something, you know, us academics, we really love to write and we really love good writers. And so folks sail through the program because they can put a good paper together, a good research paper together. But that does not necessarily mean that when they get into the community, they're gonna be really about it, right? Really about the work. And so we've had discussions of talking about how can we make sure that our assessment pr pr processes are really getting to what we value in the profession. And that is not, you know, writing is a little bit farther down on the list than I think it is in most places. Um, uh, another thing that we started to have discussions about is field practice. And this is really challenging because I'm sure all of you know, you know, we're all in this community, we're all in the field, we're all fighting for field placements every year, every semester, right? Um, but we're having conversations about um, do our field pl pr placements reflect our commitment to anti-oppressive practice. And so what I mean by that is, um, do we, are we placing students in faith-based institutions that don't support, you know, that don't allow for LGBTQ foster parents or that don't support women's body autonomy? Um, are we placing students in field placements uh, with law enforcement agencies that have, you know, sort of difficult histories with the black and brown community? Um, what is our relationship with child welfare agencies who have long had significant histories of disproportionality, um, you know, this sordid history of surveillance in black and brown communities and some see, you know, child welfare as, a, as an extension of the carceral state or the prison industrial complex. So what is our, what are the conversations that we're having with this child welfare agencies that we're dealing with and we're working with? Um, Looking at our curriculum, obviously, right? Like, do we have a commitment to making sure that our learning materials 
and our articles um, are inclusive of diverse authors and diverse researchers. And all these things are not going to happen overnight, right? Like this is a years long process. And so I think it's important for me, as I think about, you know, our terms of, of chair and program director are three years. So if I don't, if I'm not in the position when my term is ended, what are some things that can be sustained once I'm gone, right? And this commitment to looking at our field placements, looking at our curriculum, um, looking at our admissions procedures. Um, and then of course, hiring, um, you know, you know, everywhere you go, it's, they're, they're like, you're talking about, you know, hiring diverse faculty, and that's a, that's a, that's a, that's an important commitment that we have. And, you know, we look at, particularly for our Philly campus, which is very diverse in all the ways, you know, do our faculty reflect what our student body is like. But not only that, I think um, another really important thing to me is increasing the pipeline, right? And so involving students of color in research and other scholarship opportunities. You know, I have lots of students who say, I never thought I'd get an MSW and they've never thought about getting a DSW or a PhD. So if there are students who are interested in that, cultivating those interests, cultivating those um, relationships so that they know where to go so that they can learn about research that they can learn about publishing. Um, so those are some of the, the bigger bigger ways, but we've also done some other things um, in my institution. You know, we have, I started a social justice book club. So we choose a book every semester. Um, we open it up to the community. So, you know, students, faculty, staff, the larger university, alumni, stakeholders, you know, my mom's in the book club. She comes to our book club meetings. In the fall, we did hood feminism. And in the spring, we're doing um, the spring we're doing. So you want to talk about race, and so we meet once a month to discuss the book. I encourage people to come, even if you haven't read the book, because I think you can still get some really rich information and discussion. You know, even just from from being there and being in the presence of, of you know, the folks that are reading and talking about the book. Sorry, that's my dog going crazy. Um, I've also started. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, town. Rocky, come here. Let's see if I can calm him down. Um, we, a series of social justice webinars and town halls that are addressing social justice. Uh, and these are open to the community as well. Um, one thing that I've really, really enjoyed is that we've had a lot, we have a, I have a fabulous uh, curriculum committee and we've um, spent a lot of time discussing our elective options. And it, those are something that we've been able to change more quickly than, you know, Re, redoing our whole um, core curriculum in terms of making sure that our core curriculum is matching up, but we've had the opportunity to add new electives that are really addressing these anti-racist and anti-oppressive practices. So we have um, a, an elective that I developed with some colleagues called Radical Social Justice. And that one focuses on, we call it radical, right? But the thing is that none of these concepts are radical. They're just things that we don't talk about as frequently in, in social work. So we have a unit in that course talking about the prison industrial complex, focusing on trans issues, focus, focusing on um, sex workers rights, focusing on fat phobia and diet culture. Um, we have another course, social media and social movements that really talks about um, organizing and social justice movements and how social workers can contribute to that. Um, we have another elective called Social Work Without Borders. That's a new one that focuses on like pr prison abolition and prison, prison complex. Um, and another one uh, we recently created on sex and sexuality. Um, and Dr. Afford, yeah, sure. I, I mean, you that was just like, woo, it was on fire. <laughs> you were like one after another after another. And I was looking for like a, a way to get in there, but you have a couple of comments. Just some oh, folks sorry. have said, you know, excellent point, um, you know, on the importance of training students to navigate and challenge and dismantle these systems of oppression, right, including specifically the criminal justice system, but you named a, a whole bunch of them, right? And and also too, like what our role is in continuing it, because if we are placing students in some of these places, how intentional are those placements, right? Have we actually thought about the interaction? Have we tried to advocate, like, what are you guys doing to change this stuff? Are they trying to change or are they not trying to change? Are they trying to indoctrinate our students in the manner of whatever they're doing that's naughty, right? The other thing, uh, so, you know, again, someone just said great points of emphasis. The other thing too is um, I've had a few people ask for copies of whatever stuff you're sharing, right? Okay. So if it's your PowerPoint, can you put it like in a Google Drive thing? And this is for all the speakers and then be able to share it publicly for people. Um, 
you guys have mentioned some uh, resources, right? If you could put links for the resources in the chat. And I know, uh, Dr. Akbar, you had talked about like the book uh, discussions, like how can people get access to it? So like, you don't have to do it when you're talking, but maybe in the middle, just kind of throw in the links because I know a lot of people are interested and they've been asking. I'll put the flyer in the, uh, in the chat so folks can see. That's great. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was, okay, so SW Care is editing a special edition of the Advances in Social Work uh, journal. They're actually doing Dismantling White Supremacy in Social Work Education. And so uh, Rosemary is encouraging people to look at that or come out and support or, or uh, check that out. And then if you, if you have a link to that where people can get more information, feel free to share that in the chat, but that's a great idea. Dr. Akbar, if you want to continue, I didn't, I wanted to just get those comments in there, but if you had more Thank to say. You. Yes, and I'll, um, I'll add the, so the, I saw in the chat um, just now that the first book is called Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. It's great. Um, we had some great discussions around that. I highly recommend it. And the second book is called So You Want to Talk About Race. So I'm not sure what we're going to do for the summer for next semester, um, but those are the ones for the fall and spring. And I will add the book club flyer in the, in the chat when I'm done. Um, and I think, so the last point I just want to make, um, which has been really, so, you know, my colleagues at other universities um, are appalled when I tell them, you know, Westchester is a teaching university. And so our faculty are observed five times per year, twice each semester by um, the, by a peer colleague, by a peer, and once by the department chair. Um, and I really enjoy this because I have, you know, it gives me the opportunity to see different folks teaching styles, different ways that they're, you know, engaging students, especially now on Zoom. Folks have done all kinds of different things to sort of engage students and to, you know, maintain the rigor of courses, you know, even though we're not in person. But another thing that is really important thing that has allowed me to do is to um, sort of like a quality assurance or like fidelity check of whether these themes of anti-oppressive practice and anti-racism are woven throughout our curriculum. And I've been so, so pleased to see that no matter what course that I've, I've sat in, whether it's research, whether it's policy, whether it's one of our electives, whether it's you know one of our HBSCs, that there's this theme that all of our faculty are really on board with addressing how um, we can be better social workers in terms of oppression and anti-racism. Um, and so you know, I know that other places probably don't have that opportunity to observe quite as much, but it's been a really important um, really important thing for me to do and to see even that, you know, sort of my vision um, come into fruition uh, within, within my team. Hey, I guess I'm up next. Happy Social Work Month. Happy Women's History Month. This is Dr. Matthew Myrick from Widener University, Assistant Clinical Professor. Let me share my screen. Uh, you know, those who teach Zoom classes know there's always, can you see the screen? Can you hear <laughs> Uh, there's always that point. I, thank you for the thumb up, Andy. Uh, so I'm just going to just jump right into it, um, which is good. I came after Dr. Ak Akbar because some of the things I talk about are similar. Uh, I'm taking this meta view of what we're talking about here today and kind of how to make these practices applicable, but also to support our students at the same time. So again, just putting it out there, what we all know with COVID-19 and the call for racial social justice, it's impacting systemically everyone. So we're all being impacted in different ways. Some of us are finding that our normal coping skills are not working at the same time as well. We see this with our students. And there typically is a big push for how can we support the students at this time, uh, but we don't always think about how we can support ourselves at the same time. So I wanna talk about, I'll be talking about that a little bit too briefly. But, you know, I teach uh, at our BSW, MSW and PhD students. I've, when I was writing this up, I was thinking primarily of our BSW and MSW students, uh, but some of the things that I'm talking about also apply to PhD students as well. I teach online synchronously and asynchronously at our different programs. I mean, COVID has placed all of our programs, the bulk of them uh, in the Zoom rooms. Uh, so that's kind of how my teaching is presenting itself at this time and space. Uh, and 
similar to what Dr. Akbar said, like, are we on the same page about what we're talking about when we say uh, anti-racist, anti-oppressive? Because, you know, yes, we are in as part of NASWPA, but Philadelphia can look a very different from Lancaster or uh, Central, like, like different counties. So getting on the same page can be challenging in, when we think about a region, also at a university, based on our different uh, areas of practice, maybe our focus. So that's also an area of tension uh, that sometimes has to be teased out, discussed, uh, processed as a bigger group. Like, who are we? What is our identity? Uh, because ultimately, we are passing on our identity as professionals, as a university, as a college, to our students. And so our interventions, I mean, I've been seeing this at our university, and some of you also have been, may have been doing this or spoke to it already, but we have put out statements about what that means, uh, not just uh, saying we also co-sign what CSWE, NA, CSWE or NASW has done, but we also co-sign, uh, we have this from our center or from our department. Uh, policies have been put, being put in place to address everything that's been going on um, or being looked at. We're having curriculum reviews. Many people have talked about that as well as a tangible thing that's happening to basically call to task what's happening to support our students and faculty and also to live up to what we have on paper in our NASW Code of Ethics. At Widener, we have various committees. Uh, it's currently called diversity, but we're looking to change that to the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, a committee that looks at a lot of things in terms of, oh, how is diversity present in our curriculum and how can we educate and support students at the same time? But at the, in the same token, we also need to reflect on, are we being performative in this? Is this kind of just right now in this season, flavor of the month, or is this gonna be sustainable change? Uh, and some people have different opinions about putting things in your email signature, even statements. I've been in conversations where people felt like, oh, a statement was not enough. Show me, I wanna see the action, live it. Um, and I think many people, even if you are a black, and, a black and brown person yourself are being called to task on that. Uh, from sometimes even your students, right? Like you're saying you're doing these things, but how are you actually living it? So things to think about there. All right, so uh, my teaching philosophy uh, builds on social reconstructionism. And again, this idea of holistic and interdisciplinary educational experience to seek to challenge social problems and create a better world in the future. Um, tall order. I think as social workers, we aspire for that in our practice and the work we're doing in the field. And the, the classroom is a great place where this transformational change can take place by inspiring, being a mentor to uh, students in the field. Uh, at the same time, I teeter back and forth on the seesaw between being the sage on the stage. You know, I have knowledge to give you. I want you to hear this and also guide on the side, letting the students in a way talk out issues that are coming up for them in relation to real world events. Um, of course, from Bell Hooks, this idea of raising consciousness about oppression, reduce power hierarchies in the classroom, and enhance students' commitment to anti-oppressive and social change activities. This is, you know, these, this terminology has been around before last summer. It's not anything new, but again, we're all being called to task to live it and to almost in a way um, put our best foot forward about these issues and to make sustainable change in society. At the same time, you know, building on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, the oppressed are system systemically blocked in their aspirations. So critical co-learning is needed. And it, it, it's, it's this weird dance I find in the classroom because again, we have standards, we have things we want to cover, but in the same token, we, I, I think I'm someone who gets excited when my students are like, this is up. You know, this is really <laughs> like um, something that doesn't seem right. Why is this happening? They get fired up about the structure. And I like when I see those light bulbs going off in my students. Sometimes it's far and few between depending on the student's own level of engagement. But again, creating space where at least the dialogue is present, I think is critical in this. So, and here's just a non-exhaustive list of who our students are, students I've been encountering, and you may ditto this, um, 
a lot of our students have intersectional identities. There's a lot of cross cultural dynamics between who you are as educator and also who they are as student. Um, fill in the blanks there. You may be experiencing this. You may have um, seen it play out for your colleagues. We also have non we have a lot of non traditional students in our program. People who might have been in the military service who are returning. People who have been in the social service field uh, doing non quote unquote you know title protection social work, but social service work. Um, people who are adult, I said returning to school, but also a lot of students with mental health challenges and economic challenges as well. Um, questioning where, where they're gonna get their supplies. You know, Some of you may have had experiences with students who don't even buy the books, right? And we even question having the books in place. Like, should we have, a, I mean, back pre-COVID, the book would be available at the library for rental, um, but then switching a curriculum to just having PDFs as class material so it's accessible to students. Um, also with economic challenges and just challenges in general, students who don't have power, uh, don't have access to a computer are things that have been real challenges throughout this. Um, and I think post COVID, you know, social distancing, these will still be challenges for some of our students. Because as we say, some of our students are coming from uh, diverse backgrounds, may not have access to resources themselves. So what can we do for our students? Of course, uh, educationally, we have to use different methods to reach them. Uh, we can't just rely on the one trick for how we present our classes, whether that be things such as diverse uh, learning activities, groups, projects, not having projects that are not based on words, but maybe a video or pictures, right? Different ways to engage students in the material. Uh, at Widener, we've been doing a, different, a lot of different things to offer a place and space for our students to talk about things going on in the world. That includes having affinity groups. I think about our NABSW, uh, having forums or town halls for students and faculty to come together to talk about things. Also our in-service program, we open those up to our students as well as opportunities. Sometimes faculty almost uh, say, go to this event uh, in lieu of class so that we almost are scaffolding the learning that so that students aren't just, I go to my class this time and that's it. No, there's a lot of things happening across campus uh, that build uh, learning. Also focus groups, we're planning to have focus groups led by PhD students to really assess from our MSW students, what are we doing? How is diversity living? What does faculty need to do to better uh, teach about diversity or handle conversations about diversity in our curriculum? So I'm going to just talk about who our educators are. And this includes the field instructors in the room. I saw one of my field instructors, hello. Um, so what are we doing? We're walking a tightrope, right, as instructors. We, at the one hand, we're holding our students to standards, but sometimes they come with a lot of challenges. And so I think as people who might have done case management work, supported clients, we are walking this tightrope. I want to hold my student to standards but they're also dealing with intense mental health issues that can impact how they're serving our clients. Uh, so is this student, quote unquote, um, ready, field readiness to be a professional at this point? And so a lot of times I've had been part of a lot of conversations about this. I mean, we've just finished our accreditation and have also uh, went to an accreditation for um, meeting for LaSalle uh, as a stakeholder. And just thinking about we have our CSWE EPAs, but then even questioning those, right? Like, are we inherently oppressing our students with some of these standards that we're holding them to? Even the, the terminology that is so common, we are gatekeepers for the profession. When we say we're holding the keys to the gate, we have power. We are in charge of who gets in and who gets out. We have to own that, right? And there is trouble with saying this person is a fit for the profession because there's something in our mind that someone doesn't fit. And again, we can, th th I think this should not be something that we do lightly. Um, I think it takes a lot of different voices in the room, um, perspectives about like who the student is in their development uh, at this time, right? And I'm not saying that, okay, we should just say like, everybody let's open the, the doors, everyone comes in. That's not what I'm saying. But I do um, need to think of, we do need to think about how that conversation is happening. What are the factors that are adding to us saying someone 
uh, is appropriate readiness or not. Um, at the same time, um, resignations are happening at organizations. You may be seeing this at your educational institution or in your agency, because maybe someone in light of everything that's happening in the world is saying, this organization is not meeting, meeting my needs at this time. And we have a lot of questions, I think, again, the tightrope of this idea of quality versus quantity. We've seen that with uh, best examples I have our writing. Dr. Akbar talked about this, like someone knowing APA, right? Um, if the assignment was presented a different way, would the student be able to uh, present their case, their points more effectively? But we, we all will say a social worker needs to be able to write their notes because they could be subpoenaed, they could be brought uh, forward for um, someone's future. So we can't just dismiss the importance of notes. Also field hours, I think in light of everything that's happened uh, with COVID, uh, the reduction of field hours, right? So, I mean, these standards that are in place about how many hours need to be in place for someone to be, you know, they have gotten it at the field, right? And I think those are discussions that are happening among a lot of field consortiums in our area. It, I'm gonna jump in here. Um, this is Alex again. And a few people made comments in the you know, comment box and they said that they really appreciated your uh, mentioning the doctoral programs because that's really important and we often overlook that. And if you think about the doctoral programs, we're sending people out to become faculty. And if we don't do a good job with this, they're gonna go out and just sort of continue the pattern. So we definitely need to, we need to work on that. Um, so that's a really, a really good point. Thank you for that. Um, and of course, I mean, I, I wasn't sure who was gonna be in the room, uh, but some of my, th my work with PhD students has kind of added to this. Um, and I'm not far removed from being a PhD student myself. Um, so just, I think my final points uh, here, yeah, this is my last slide. Um, so what do we do now? You know, I think we're throwing a lot of ideas out there to stir the pot. Um, I call for collective care. Uh, again, we do a lot of work to take care of our students programming, but we also need to take care of ourselves as professionals. I mean, I know there were a lot of uh, meetings uh, in services since this summer, anti-racism summit, there's another one this week, right? And also being comfortable with sometimes saying like, I have to step back from this um, because I might be living it, I'm dealing with it with my students, I don't need to be present at all of these. I think we should also role model that for our students as well. Um, boundaries with what they choose to engage with in terms of, because of course, some of the material being covered could activate them for lack of a better word. Also, we need to be open to lifelong learning. Uh, at Widener, we, a lot, many of us as faculty and staff uh, buy into uh, and try to live uh, cultural humility in our practice. Uh, from Turvalon and Murray Garcia. We incorporate it into our curriculum. We educate our students about it in various ways. Also, um, we need to mobilize our professional support network. And sometimes I think, uh, you know, when a student might send an email or something may happen in class, some of the best, uh, the best step could be not to reply to that email right away and maybe to talk to a colleague about it and just say, this happened in class today. Am I off base with this? because I personally know from experiences, sometimes that is the difference between me sending a very heated email to a student, uh, questioning their performance and ability in the field and taking more of an, a supportive educational stance about tell me more about what's going on here. And I would have liked for this to have happened in the course of the classroom. Um, and we need to also model for our students that they also need to build a structure of support, professional support for themselves because Think about boundaries. We can't always go to our family and friends to talk about what be, might be happening. Uh, we might need other a professional network of support uh, to help us in our growth and development. Also mentorship that involves mentoring other faculty members, other budding professionals and students as well. Um, and that can look very different depending on kind of your position at your university and college as well. Uh, again, we have to meet, use various methods to meet the needs of different learners, really rethinking about the assignments. It's, um, you know, e we might have something we're comfortable utilizing as faculty, whether that be, okay, papers, um, 
you know, message boards, but but why? What about a video? What about having an assignment be expressed through uh, a, a picture or another method, right? Maybe it's a you have them record a conversation talking about it, right? With Zoom, that's something that's possible. Um, I've had students do that in order to kind of shift the way the assignment is completed, but still getting them to think about the concept. Um, you also, we also have to build rapport between the content and the students, right? So what's happening in their lives? I, I sometimes go into lectures that I'm really excited that students are going to like, this is the day they're going to all be about this concept. And then it's crickets. And then there's a the day I kind of go in, oh, this is sort of going to be an okay activity. And the students say, this is the best activity ever, ever. So we always have to be open to maybe how the information lands with our students, uh, which can vary depending on the day and who's in the classroom. And I just want to end with um, these two quotes, assist students in finding their voice. I think that the quotes, reclaiming my time and I'm speaking are so, resonate with so many people for the sheer fact that it's about speaking and basically saying, I am here, I am present. What I say has value. You may not like it, but I have a right to have the mic and to hold it and to speak my piece. And I think that process can be challenging, right? Because sometimes students find their voice and it's like, whoa, that was a lot. Um, so it, again, it's a dance. We're doing a constant dance here, but um, hopefully what I offered you was um, coherent and had a lot of things to stir the pot. And I thank you for letting me share space today. Okay, I guess I'm on. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for all the professors. Is there an echo? Okay, um, so thank you, um, everybody, for being here today, and uh, I'm really excited. Am I the only one hearing an echo? There is a little bit of an echo. Do you have a second device by chance? It's, it's not on. So I apologize, everybody. I'm, I apologize. Yeah, you, if there's a second device, then sometimes there's an echo. But if, if you try to mute it, uh, then it could reduce it. But I think we should just go with it. Let's yes. just roll with it for now. Yes, I'll turn my phone actually off, off, off. I think that's better. Okay, and I apologize for the sun glare as well. So um, my name is Annette Day. As Alex was saying earlier, um, um, part of Boundary Span LLC. It is a therapy practice that I founded like some years ago. Um, so it's therapy, clinical supervision, and also um, some consultation. But I wanna, I'm gonna talk to you more, like a, take a different bent today than the esteemed professors did and talk to you more from a clinical background because I am a clinician. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about me. And then um, I really appreciate everything that everybody had to say about like the students. I remember some years ago, my experience being an MSW student. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. So I'm gonna talk to you more about like how to address issues of white supremacy and clinical practice and how to equip our practitioners on these relevant topics from a clinical standpoint. I do not have a PowerPoint because again, I'm a clinician, so I'm more like conversational. Um, so I appreciate you all bearing with me with that. Um, so again, you know, I'm founder of Boundary Span, um, and in, in addition to that, um, I did teach um, a few adjunct courses some years back. I taught at Lincoln and then with their um, Bachelor's of Human Services program, as well as LaSalle and Westchester, actually, before they had the, temp the Philadelphia campus. So I remember that. I was like so excited. And then life changed and I went on to have kids and et cetera. Um, so um, I wanted to become a therapist, which I've been doing for some years now. I'm very happy about that. Um, additionally, so in addition to also being a therapist and a mom um, and a wife, I am president of Pennsylvania Society for Clinical Social Work. So a lot of what I'll be talking to you today about um, will be, you know, from a standpoint, again, clinical, you know, kind of like the leadership from a leadership standpoint and a practice standpoint. So um, that's a little bit more about me. Um, so I, I was thinking back as the, the professor spoke and thinking back to when I was a student and I actually went to Temple and I see Mr. Kumi on here, Dr. Kumi and Professor Milner. Um, and when I was a student and um, somebody um, mentioned the other day, because I'm also a part of Clinical Social Work Association, and they mentioned like a social justice track. And I'm like, wow, 
there was no social justice track <laughs> years ago when I was an MSW student. Not that, of course, it wasn't needed. It just didn't exist. There was no social justice course um, years ago when I was a student. And um, there were some interesting conversations that I had um, in my MSW in practice and policy classes. I really enjoyed my time um, at to you, um, and I have respect for all the social work schools, but I, I really did enjoy my time. And I also noticed that, um, yeah, I, again, being well, being in a minority, you know, and I know, um, you know, people will call Temple Diversity University, and um, yet I was still like in a minority, and, and you know, having certain conversations in class that were really charged. You know, because nobody was talking about social justice, as Dr. Akbar says, like a buzzword now. And Dr. Meyer says, like the trend now, the thing that everybody's talking about. And nobody was talking about it, I'll just say 15 or so years ago when I was a student. It, it, you know, it just wasn't talked about. Um, but yet, you know, I would bring it up, it would come up in classes because, you know, we're living in this society and it's not like 15 years ago you know there was no issues in social justice there was no racism it's just it wasn't a buzzword it wasn't like you know this is like post george floyd now whereas before it was a little different i like to think if i had been born like a generation earlier i probably been part of the black panthers um so i was like always um, <laughs> my professors probably will remember i was a little bit of a rebel even when i was like in school and still am a rebel so the the conversations that would come up would be pretty interesting but again it wasn't really talked about and when it was talked about um they were i'll just say they were very interesting conversations um, so I, I want to talk to you also about like, you know, the three different, three different levels. I know Dr. Myra has had mentioned like the meta level and, you know, kind of like approaching things from a micro, meso and macro level, like the work that I'm doing and how we can actually address this with our practitioners, you know, in addition to our students who will become the practitioners, in addition to, you know, become, having our students become leaders in the field. Um, so again, I want to address it from all angles and I'll start off by, you know, talking about, you know, after talking about like my experience as a student, more like so like being an advocate, because I think it's really important as we educate our students and, you know, we might, you know, be um, leading them or gearing them to, of course, you know, we need more people of color, you know, to become doctors, you know, and, and professors and, and being a teaching position. Um, and I like to think, you know, people can teach and lead from all different areas. We need that. Um, and then we also need, you know, people to continue to do in the practice, because I'm sure as you can all probably imagine with post COVID and, you know, we're living in COVID right now, we need more therapists. And um, us therapists who see our therapists, need, they need therapists, there's a lot going on. So I'm, I'm glad that, you know, folks earlier mentioned, you know, the mental health, depressive mental health needs, because it's a real thing, you know, and we need more practitioners of color also in the field. You know, I know I, you know, I can't, for instance, my private practice right now is like on hold because I'm working full time and, you know, with PSCSW and everything. So I have to, I'm referring people out and like even with my full-time role, you know, of say a, a case over about 30, we need more practitioners in the field and we need competent practitioners of all hues in the field. So I'm really, really grateful, you know, when we talk about like the students and like the next generations, which is a little weird for me to say at my age, I'm kind of like in the middle. Um, but I, I really want to talk about like have a little bit of a foot more of a focus on mental health. So when I think Dr. Myrick was saying earlier had mentioned like the mental health of the students, I, I just I, I think about this on a regular basis. Like wouldn't it be so awesome if every school of social work like actually mandated mental health, I mean MSW students to actually even do at least a form of brief therapy. Um, because it's real, you know, the the issues that we're hearing on a regular basis, even in the field the vicarious trauma. I remember when I was in grad school, I did a lot of work on vicarious trauma and secondary you know, stress because I was living it. I was um, a part-time student and a full-time worker like in social services and I was living it. And so I think it's really important you know, to put a focus on that, make sure that our students are also, as Dr. Myra was saying, taking care of their self-care because for one, we don't want them to get burned out before they're even in the field, like full-time. Um, and that's a 
very real possibility if we don't hone in on, you know, in addition to, you know, the, the policy work, you know, and the research, which is very important, but also thinking about like the real nitty gritty, you know, and the mental health issues that are coming up and that are going to continue to come up. So I wanted to mention that as well. Um, and then, you know, wanted to talk about, you know, as a social work leader, how important it is. Because again, you know, I like to think that we're talking to our students, we're preparing them to be, you know, you know, leaders in the field. So we're preparing them to be, you know, to teach the next generation of social workers. We're preparing them to serve our clients because there are many of our clients who, you know, might want um, a therapist that looks like them. And that's not a bad thing. I know a lot of times, you know, there's like a delicate balance because, you know, it, again, social justice is a real issue. There's a lot that we're all grappling with when it comes to racism, you know, and I've had clients tell me, you know, or tell my people that my colleagues, you know, they don't want to work with a black therapist. You know, I've had my share of racism as a black therapist in the field, um, stemming from like when I first started out as a therapist, you know, so that's very real as well. We need people again, of all hues to be competent. So I'm talking about like, you know, BIPOC and people who are not BIPOC, you know, to really understand the different levels, you know, that it all entails when it comes to like social justice and anti-racism work. So I wanna also talk to you more about, you know, what I do like on a practice level, because I know Dr. Mike was saying, you know, people want you to don't just, you know, talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Um, so I wanted to, talk to you about some more of the work that I'm doing, um, you know, as a leader in the field and also like as a practitioner. So um, we know, again, we're, we're in COVID right now, you know, and we, uh, everybody witnessed what was happening. I, I, I think people are talking about the dual pandemics that we're in um, and that we're still in, we continue to be in. So part of the work that I'm doing right now is um, trying to look at the police force in Philadelphia, um, because I am based in Philadelphia and, or in the surrounding counties. And you know I'm part of a working group. So it's a group of licensed social workers, as well as nurse practitioners and attorneys that are working on looking at Looking at the Philadelphia Police Department, I'm, I guess I'm choosing my words delicately because um, there's a lot of different views on this. Um, some people would say, you know, they're a reformist. Some people would say they're an abolitionist. Um, so, but we're, we're definitely taking a look at, you know, all the funding that is going into the Philadelphia Police Department and where can we make it so, you know, where can we help it so that, you know, there's more funding going into mental health and, and helping people, you know, like, you know, may he rest in peace, Walter Wallace Jr., who lost his life because, you know, the police came out and they didn't come out to help them. Instead, they murdered him. They killed him, you know, and it didn't have to be that way. So we're looking at the funding that's going into it, you know, and seeing, well, can there be a different response? Some people are talking about like a co-responder model. Um, there, we're looking into like having solely mental health professionals come out instead of the police. It is a lot of um, interest in work. We're meeting with council folks, you know, in Philadelphia. So um, that's what I do with my husband, who's also a social worker and with the temple, but we didn't meet at temple. But anyway, this is top. Um, he always says, oh, this is like the other work that you're doing. So, um, so I will also like encourage, I know there's some students on now to look at it. You know, I, I love social work, you know, and I, and I don't think, you know, like when after five o'clock, my social work hat doesn't come off, um, which is also why I would stress self-care because <laughs> that's important too. And I have to have people remind me about my self-care, but that's some of like the practice work that I'm doing in addition to, you know, being like a leader with Pennsylvania Society for Clinical Social Work. I'll talk more about that and trying to look at the time because I know there will be questions. Sorry. Yeah, actually, uh, that's a, a great thing to think about the time. So we have about 10 minutes left for questions. Okay. Uh, so I'll wrap up. You could, you could say, you know, one or two more things if you want, or if you feel like you're good, then we could uh, open it up. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so overall, I just wanted to, to say, I think it's really important to address things from different levels. So again, you know, from, you know, this is so exciting when Omar asked me about it, I was like very excited because I wanna always have an opportunity to talk to the students, you know, as we become practitioners, as we become leaders in the field. And again, I'll just end by saying, you know, we need to address things from all different levels the micro, meso and macro and um, all different hues because we're, we're all a part of this human race and we need to, we just need to get better. 
So thank you all. All right, thank you. So big round of applause for all the speakers, all the panelists. Thank you so much for investing the time and all that stuff um, and sharing all your great information. I mean, there were several points where I was just, whew, it was so interesting. I'm Googling on the side, trying to find the resources that you guys had talked about. So I really appreciate all the effort and work and um, to come and prepare. So we're gonna open it up now. Um, people can ask questions. You can unmute yourself freely. Um, you can also just type a question in the chat and I'll facilitate those questions. Um, people can also share reflections. So what is something that struck you today? Either something that you thought was really helpful or something that maybe you hadn't thought about or that you'd like to reemphasize um, or any questions for any of the panelists. So go. TikTok, TikTok. I can start singing. Would that motivate anybody? I'll stop singing and I can't sing. I'm just saying. That'll motivate people to start asking questions because otherwise I'm gonna sing. You don't want me to sing, people. Come on now. I'll I know ask somebody's- a question. Yes, thank you, go. <laughs> okay, so um, I am really excited to be here. I'm a newly admitted MSW student starting in summer. Um, so I'm really uh, grateful for this opportunity because this is right in line with why I'm pursuing um, the Master of Social Work. But my question is um, to the point of social workers sometimes um, contributing to the oppressive systems. Are students, in addition to being taught how not to be that person, how not to, you know, how to be anti-oppressive, are they also given any kind of support or um, instruction, education on how to be a safe advocate or ally for their client who might be the recipient of racism? Um, and I think about, you know, situations where I as a white person don't want to put someone into more harm by intervening and, um, doing something harmful. So is there any kind of support in that in any of the curriculum? That's an excellent um, point. And, you know, uh, I'm not a social worker and um, I teach social workers and I teach policy courses, master level. And it kind of shocked me um, to see that my students didn't know about healing ethno-racial trauma, right? The, the Chavez Duenas model of care for immigrant population never heard uh, of Dr. DeGroy's work on post-traumatic and slave syndrome. So what can we do? We need to expose our students to these models of care, right? That, 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 are, that were built by black and brown uh, faculty for us, by us. And, and I think we need to do more of that um, as faculty expose our students to these models of care, right? To working um, with immigrant communities, with monolingual Spanish speaking folks, right? Um, with African Americans. And, 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 and that's what I wanted to add and stress. Um, we need to do a better job, right? Um, and, and, and it saddened me that, you know, my students were not exposed to this, right? In, in, in their coursework. And, and I think we need to do a better job on these models of cares for working with our communities. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. And I would say also, you know, finding weight because these are challenging conversations to have and especially for students who um, some of these may be new concepts, right? Or new things that they've not really explored or, th or thought about or talked about a lot. And so really finding a way, even sometimes outside of the classroom where students don't have to feel pressure that if they say the wrong thing, it's gonna impact their grade, right? So I think these community conversations are really important as well. That's why we're having um, the town halls and webinars and places where we can congregate that are like outside of the traditional classroom. Um, even though I do think the learning in the classroom of course is important as well, but I want students to have the space to make a mistake, right? So like I tell students that in the classroom, in these conversations, that's where you wanna make the mistake. This is a place for learning. It's okay to be feeling your way out, right? You'd rather, I'd rather you do that with me in the safety of our department than out causing harm to someone you know, in practice. Um, but I try to make space for it outside of a traditional classroom environment too, I think is really important. Thanks, Dr. Akbar. Sure. 
Um, Dr. Martinez shared some resources in the chat window. Check out that. Alex had a comment in there. I'll encourage everyone to go in there and just read the comment. Um, what are the questions do we have or comments or reflections people want to share? I'd like to make a comment, a uh, reflection, possibly a question. This Great. is Karen Hudson. Um, and I've been practicing social work now for 40 years. So, you know, it's been a minute. And so listening to all of these comments, you know, um, these concepts that we talk about, these are not new. Um, and they have been around for a long time. And so, you know, I too feel like it is great that we are exposing our students to this and that we as social workers are trying to, um, you know, carry this mantle and dismantle some of this in ways that perhaps we haven't in the past. But my fear and my worry is as well, you know, is this something um, that is here for the time being or is this real? You know, what kind of accountability is really going to be embedded around all of this so that we are creating the social workers that we really want to create to do the real work around um, fighting these inequities? I just worry about that because again, as I said, I've been around for a long time. Um, I feel like there's much more conversation that's happening on these topics in this space these days than I've known and seen in my career. Um, and I think that's a good thing, but I still worry about um, the accountability around all of this. I have the same thought, Dr. Hudson. It's so good to see you here. It's good to um, see you too. Yes, and I just, I think that's where we have our personal accountability. Of course, hopefully universities, organizations will have things in structure that make this sustainable over time. Of course, time mm -hmm. will tell, right? I mean, as many of the people on the panel said today, like the next big thing comes up, the next, the next big wave of treatment, and then we're all on the wagon. And then this, and then it's like, okay, what happened to that five years ago? But I think especially those who personally are committed to this are going to keep infusing this into how they interact with students. Dr. Hudson, I know you have done that with the student who we are working with. Uh, so I just, I think if we are committed to it personally, we, it, we're going to keep reminding others of it too, uh, by our examples. But I do, I worry too, that it's kind of like the flavor of the month and then we'll like forget about it. Yeah, and I think you nailed it, right? We need to do a critical assessment of the historical and current practices that have limited the full engagement of folks, right? Like systems, right? Educational system. And the only tenure Latino professor at Temple's University School of Social Work, right? And, and the College of Public Health, right? And this is Temple where most of our students are black and brown, right? Uh, so, so we need to be thinking, I mean, and that's not Temple, that's pervasive across School of Social Work and College of Public Health in the country, right? The lack of representation of black and brown folks in positions of power, right? And tenured positions. So. Um, Dr. Hudson, I think you nailed it, right? We need to do an assessment of these systems and these practices that are preventing folks like you and I uh, uh, to reach these positions of powers to affect change. Otherwise, we're not, uh, I'm scared, right? Like we're not gonna see long-term uh, continuation of these topics because the systems itself, right? Prevent uh, people like, like us to engage in this discussion. So um, we need to do more than just this symposium, right? And, and really dismantle the systems and the practices that are preventing people like me with an accent and degree and NIH funded from getting tenure faculty positions. Great point. So thank you all so much for everything that you shared. I, I'm gonna push back on one thing um, that you said, Karen, you said that all this information isn't necessarily new. It may not be new to you, but there are many people who have never heard these things before. And if we underestimated how many people, you know, haven't heard these things prior to the last couple of years, like if you think about it, there's a lot of people who need, you know, the, the one thing that struck me was in Andy's presentation that um, the spectrum of people, right? You know, it's like sort of, open, you know, I would say like openly hostile or, you know, insightful and thoughtful. But, you know, if you think about it, right, try, there's a lot of people in many areas of that spectrum, right? And if we think about it, it's like 50% are on the naughty side. So um, I really think that if we have the attitude of like, you should know by now, um, it's not going to help the people who really don't know, but want to know that, that, you know, are open to it, you know, so it is. So I think trying to have that. The other thing, too, is I would say, 
you know, being the Pauseway president, one of the things that I've tried to figure out is action, right? So we can yammer on here for 90 minutes. I mean, we all feel better. We all think it's inspiring or whatever, but what are we doing, right? What are some small things that we can do, some specific actions? Maybe that is start a marketing campaign to hire more diverse faculty. Um, when we were hiring new faculty at Millersville, I mean, I was so aggressive with my marketing trying to recruit diverse faculty, and yet we had none. We had none that applied. Now, maybe that's because no, everybody thinks Lancaster, Pennsylvania is Amish farmland, right? And people don't want to come work there, but, but how do we do it? How do we help? Like, even when we want to, right, what are those, what are those things? So what are small specific projects and again if we're focused on let's say pennsylvania social work education i think sometimes if we get to too big we can't really manage it but like what can we do in our situation you know what can we do here and i think and i know we um omar you had the social justice committee right you guys were working on trying to do some stuff but you know, so that's something if people are interested in, in being a part of actual change, you know, let us know. We can help sort of support those efforts. Um, but uh, Omar, I'm going to give you a last last word. Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I just want to thank all the speakers, Dr. Agbar. I mean, Andy, name it, um, you know, like for, for your contribution and Dunlap um, for, for your service and you know, let, let's let's keep the let's keep the good work. You know, we're all all at the forefront out there trying to challenge these systems um, that target us, right? Um, that target our skin color, our accent, that that prevent access um, um, to service and, and name it. So let's keep up the good work and, and and showing the models that actually work and highlighting what you know, implementation science, medical legal partnerships, right? Curriculum transformation and 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 um, yeah, um, that's that's what we got. That's what we got to do. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording, but you all are welcome to kind of hang out if you have any more questions.